Okay, Janet Dixon, Biology of Kundalini. We are in part three, The Cycles of Awakening, okay? We're on page 75, if you're following along, it begins, Kundalini is the unfolding of the coil of the cosmos. Kundalini is so interrelated, not too, with the rest of cosmos that trying to convey it in words and facts is very difficult. One can never express the complexity and interrelatedness of the exquisite, sensible, inevitable sequence of alchemical events. The mysterious, awe-inspiring thing is how the universe wakes itself up by giving birth to the new out of the bones of the old. Makes me think of skeleton woman, women who run with the wolves. One's entire being and life prior to an awakening goes into the making and riding of the wave. The whole universe is a kundalini machine winding us up to ever increasing sentience. With active kundalini, it is apparent that the body is a tuning fork for the entire planet and solar system. I can feel my kundalini responding the low pressures of hurricanes to the low, low pressures of hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico as bliss in the lungs and belly. On a subliminal level, a kundi active will give a greater biological response to the long waves transmitted through the earth from waves crashing on the shore during a hurricane and those initiated from the buildup of pressure before an earthquake. So if you are awaken if you are beyond your initial kundalini awakening is saying like you will biologically respond more noticeably if you were to take like your vitals and everything uh, you will have a bigger response than someone else to a hurricane or an, an earthquake as the hurricanes start forming in the atlantic the energy will move down into the lungs and belly and then in november down in the pelvis and through the jaw she says, I go into radical ecstasy and kundi heat for the four to five days in which a huge hurricane or cyclone is occurring in other parts of the world, such as the Caribbean or Bangladesh. I think, however, that I may only register a significant charge from storms that are occurring in the same hemisphere of the globe as me. These peak, this peak in ecstasy may be due to the particular frequency of the sub-audible sound of Schumann harmonic which must affect everything from the atoms in the body to the resonance within the cavity of the skull. The Schumann resonance is generated in the resonant cavity between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. So that's like the pulse of the Earth, right? The Schumann resonance. So the more we're awake, the more we realize that we are actually being affected by that. The same solar, lunar, climatic, ionic, and atmospheric conditions that create hurricane season also generate the blissful kundalini in the lungs and belly, she says. The hurricane bliss could partly be due to seismic waves caused by the hurricane. These seismic waves created by a hurricane in the Atlantic pass through the entire United States. Kundalini actives are supersensory and their enteric brain, the brain in your stomach, is particularly sensitive and active. Thus, it is easy to understand how seismic waves coming through the ground would be registered physically, electrically, and atomically, quantum, and ionically. She quotes Hurricane Katrina's waves felt in California um, by Gerstoff, who says seismic surface waves which traveled through the Earth's crust were detected 30 hours before the hurricane made landfall, while body waves, which bounced down into the mantle, arrived some 18 hours later. The body waves had traveled down to 1,100 kilometers inside the Earth. That's on newscientist.com. Earthquakes are also easily detected in a body that's highly lit with kundalini, a normal person would still be receiving and perhaps behaviorally responding to these changes, but they just don't register it consciously because their sensitivity 
um, and effects in the body is lower. Be aware also that with heightened kundalini, you will be able to pick up the long waves that precede earthquakes and also feel the pressure of ionic changes in the atmosphere as a very heavy prefrontal lobe days coupled with adrenal activation for up to two to four days preceding a major earthquake in your hemisphere. While Boulder, Colorado, I think she means while in Boulder, Colorado, I felt the 6.5 Paso Roblos quake on 12-23-03 as a very heavy prefrontal lobe daze and noticed there was a Chinook positive ion high wind at the time. The positive ion high wind over here in Colorado is signified by a special type of compact high wind clouds and high pressure in the body. I theorize the atmospheric positive ion sheet probably existed over California and reached out to Colorado. During the day of the 2003 quake, I did register a significant adrenal danger flush, she calls it. However, I was in such bliss at the time that the danger sense I felt to not be personally relevant. Um, NOAA and the Russians are collaborating on a satellite detection system of ionic spheric changes related to imminent earthquakes and predict, can predict a quake and anticipate its size two days before it occurs. The influences on Kundalini by geomagnetic stress of earthquakes build up and the weather, the space weather, can be explained by changes in the Schumann resonance and ionosphere affecting the cells. Between the Earth's surface and the ion ionosphere, a resonating cavity is formed. Broadband electromagnetic impulses, like those from lightning flashes, fill this cavity and create globally the Schumann resonance at frequencies of 5 to 50 hertz. Now the base Schumann resonance is 7.8 hertz. That's what the Earth's heartbeat normally is. So when there's these spikes in the Schumann resonance and it's gone much higher than 500, there's times when you, if you look at the chart, you see the white out, which means it's off the charts, that resonance. And that's also the Earth's Kundalini being affected, right? Um, the base Schumann resonance is 7.8 Hertz, quasi standing electromagnetic waves, mainly traveling from west to east. There is a plus minus of 0.5 Hertz daily variation which is a function of the height of the ionosphere, which changes with solar activity. So as we get solar flares and these sorts of things, that's going to change and heighten the Schumann resonance. Obviously, huge high or low pressure systems would also alter the height of the ionos ionosphere, pushing or pulling on it as it were the membrane of a balloon. So where I'm at right now in Arizona, we've been having massive lightning storms every night for over a week. And I mean, they're massive, they're just, the lightning's never stopping. It's just like crack, 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 crack for hours. So that's definitely changing the ionosphere. And I know I've been feeling it in my own body, especially as a left pressure in my head, uh, the vagus nerve along the Kundalini main trail of the Shishumna all the way down to my left hip. So very much like she's described, it creates like this pressure as this life force energy, this metamorphic transmutative pulse this higher frequency is traveling through my body too just like um, it's happening in the area through their own dc field all living organisms are plugged into the electromagnetic field of the earth which varies in response to the sun and the moon because someone with active kundalini has a heightened field and superfluid condition magnetic storms on the sun and the sunspot cycle will affect them more than the average organism. The Earth's normal field resonance at alpha 10 hertz normalizes our own field and biorhythms, and we remain in sync with the planet through her field changes affecting a change in our own. So that's like being with like circadian rhythms, like we're, we're linked up with the planet's field. Of course, we need to continue to be in nature for that to stay true. When we're to set in, shut inside, that does affect our ability to harmonize and align and entrain with the earth. Changes in the earth's field affect the pineal gland production of melatonin and serotonin, as well as changing acetylcholine levels in the brain stem. 
In this respect, not only do our own normal biorhythms respond this way, but so do our psychic and spiritual capacities respond to changes in the earth's field. So that's why at certain times you'll feel more psychic or you'll be more tapped in because there is a change in the electromagnetic field resonance of the earth. Thus, we are keyed into a cosmic timing device for emerging consciousness that is governed largely by the movement, movements of the earth, sun, and moon, which is why eclipse season is so powerful and coming up again, I think, this October or November. Researchers will find that kundalini, and indeed normal physiology, follows the rhythm of the sun's magnetic field, solar wind field, sector boundary. Okay, so solar flares definitely affect us. One effect of this is the alteration of intestinal bacteria and pathogen count and immune cell spectrum and number. The two-day turbulence during the move from one sector boundary to another will also affect our biology consciousness and behavior. Kundalini, like cell growth, health, intellect, and consciousness itself follows cosmic cycles, whose influence include oxygen consumption, pH, cell division, the rate of cell division, um, sentience rates, membrane fluidity rates, and uptake elimination rates of cells, precipitation rates of chemical reactions, the propensity to greater or less colloidal suspension, flocculation, I have no idea what that is, sounds cool though, growth rates of pathogens, so these things are all influenced, um, kundalini is also influenced like these in this cycle, the cosmic cycle wave, um, hormone output and fertility rates to the, add to that list. The solar lunar impacts on changes of atmospheric ion affect the polarization of cells and organisms. Ionization and ion differential charge, polarization and firing capacity of the nerves, hormonal neurotransmitters and receptor changes. So saying these solar and lunar happenings impact and change the ionic atmosphere, right? And it changes the polarization of the cells. Sometimes the cells are shifting their magnetic flow um, and the firing of the nerves and the hormonal uh, neurotransmitter receptors, they're all being impacted by the solar lunar happenings. Cosmic influences probably also affect the speed and spectrum of protein and enzyme construction. Free radical and antioxidant changes would factor into all this. All these cosmic influences boil down to our subjective experience, such that we are the cosmos. So of course they're affecting us because as within, so without. As the kundalini or consciousness is evolving externally, it's also in, evolving internally. The light of the solar rays as they're expanding through these solar ejections, that's also our internal consciousness, right? Like expanding too. Humans and perhaps all animals have magnetic sensing material in the ethmoid bone, which is located in the sinus close to the pineal and pituitary gland. The slight rotation of the magnetic crystals in response to external changes in the field is picked up by the nerve ending in the area, right? Robert Becker and Gary Selden suggest this organ also transmits the biocycle timing cues from the Earth's field, uh, micropulsations to the pineal gland. You might detect a rapid change in field through the sensation in the area of the sinuses. So if there is any deviation in there, that might block that reception. Perhaps one of the best texts on electromagnetic effects on life is still The Body Electric. It's an older book by uh, Robert Becker, MD, and Gary Selden. In chapter 14, Breathing with the Earth, um, he covers or they cover the Earth's field effect on life. And this next quote is from page 249. Um, she calls it particularly interesting. And it says, and she quotes, Recently, a group under Indian biophysicist Sarada Subramanyam report that the human 
EEG not only responds to micropulsations, but responded differently, depending on which way the subject's head was facing in relation to the Earth's field. Hmm. Oddly enough, however, the head direction had no effect if the subject was a yogi. Hmm. Meaning, practicing meditation, mindfulness, inner union, okay? So it didn't, then it didn't matter because the poles were balanced. But in a normal human, if they aren't balanced, you are going to be more affected by the earth's field. Presumably, the yogi's stabilized, strengthened field is less influenced by interference of external fields, which is the whole reason to practice yoga and meditation, is so that you are not being externally influence that you are the cause you are influencing your reality instead this might hint at the difference between a yogi and an ordinary person going through a kundalini awakening the yogi's mind and structure is cohesive aligned and his autonomic system is consciously directed the fact that a yogi is autonomous from the earth's emf probably shows that they have changed their nerve response to that magnetic crystal in the forehead through their own amplified brain EMFs. Now that is a huge thing and why third eye awakening is the very important first practice you can ever do. If you want to practice yoga or meditation or deal with this kind of stuff, you want to like be doing the Shambhavi Mudra, you want to be do practicing Tra Talk on the candle flame, you want to be chanting Om, you want to be doing things that strengthen that and, and um, awaken that faculty. The practices of yogi, the breathing, fasting, meditation, and yoga would build a very different body-mind than the average gym-goer or householder. A yogi would have already cleared inferior cellular structure blockages, chemical imbalances, have a strong neurotransmitter and hormone profile, superior immune system and antioxidant system because their bodies are trained to convey higher energies and consciousness. Brain mapping would show quite a different brain structure and nervous system than the person who is not trained in this way. It does change your brain, especially like mantra, meditation, it changes your DNA, changes your brain. Changes in the solar cycle affect our biology and behavior. For example, around solar max, you would find more wars occurring around the world because the increased solar wind creates more positive ions, which aren't the good ones, right? In the air, which in turn makes the blood and cell environment more acidic, right? High positive ions, more acidic. Negative ions, more alkaline, right? Acidic pH leads to more aggression. There is defensive cellular response rather than a growing one. It's apparent from tracking my metamorphic cycles that the power up during the gravitational highs of full or new moon. So the power up is happening um, in the high of a full or a new moon, she was saying, um, powering up to the metamorphosis. Sometimes it's the new moon when I'm peaking and other times it's the full moon, depending on which has the highest tides. The higher the tide, the greater the tidal influence on the atmosphere as well, and this translates into greater ionic effects on life forms. So we can not automatically say that it is a gravitational trigger to metamorphosis or an ionic because it's actually both. Full moon changes the surface tension in the water in the body and thereby affects the endocrine system. That's interesting. Full moon changes the surface tension of the water in the body. Metamorphosis is also socially initiated as well, but even the cycle of spiritual alchemy of the social guru romance effect is directly initiated and influenced by the solar lunar cycles, gravitational, ionic, atmospheric, barometric, and cosmic wave influx. She's saying even the romance stuff and the Shakti pot from a guru, that's also being directed by these greater cosmic cycles. Also, the sunspot cycle and the magnetic axis flips and changes of polarity in the eight-day solar skirt sector. The sun, moon, Jupiter, and to a lesser effect, the other planets as well, 
all play into the progressive unfoldment of the metamorphic butterfly, both individually and collectively. So she points out the sun and moon, because in Ha and Tha, the sun and moon are correlating with the two uh, main channels of Ida and Pingala. And then interestingly, Jupiter, that is the guru planet and the expansive energy, she's saying these are the most influential planets um, in our metamorphic process. Earth's orbit is elliptical or slightly oval shaped. This means there is one point on the orbit where Earth is closer to the sun and another where Earth's farthest. The closest point, the perihelion, occurs in early January when sun-Earth distance will be at about 147,093,602 kilometers. And Earth speeds up a bit in the orbitable, in the orbital progress. Okay, well that's in early January. The far point, the eighth Leon, happens in early July, where the Earth Sun distance will be 152,997,053 kilometers, and Earth moves slower than average along its path. The passing of equinoxes and solstices has a huge impact on our Kundalini consciousness, biology, and magnetic influence on life processes, health, and behavior. Very big portals. Um, like giant pressure points that let in more access to cosmic energy, right? There's a distinct seasonal progression of metamorphosis, which she also is calling love, which repeats itself with precision year after year. July is the most energy expansive month of the year when the physical potency of spirit is most noticeable. If you are a female, you might even mistake July's high vitalism for pregnancy, for there is a sense of fullness and wholeness in the belly and a pressure of fullness in the head and throat, while the heart seems more connected to everything during this time. Also, there's a heaviness like being grounded, which makes walking slower. In high energy people, you can actually see this July fullness in their face. They look like they're pregnant, bursting with energy. Head pressure and the sound of pulsing or ringing in the ears can get intense during this head popping month, um, especially in August and September. I've definitely now in August noticed a lot of head pressure. There are things you can do for blood pressure and tinnitus, but the best thing is long walks near moving water and lying on the grass and staying away from carbohydrates and dairy, interestingly. I mean, not completely away from carbs, but supplements for tinnitus, pressure, and vertigo are in the back of this book, okay? October full moon, kundalini is in the lungs and digestive system. This feels really blissful, but makes a mess of your digestion, she says. Then in November full moon, it moves into the pelvis, because then we're getting into Sagittarius time and through the jaw. And then the winter solstice, after that, it flips back into the heart-brain connection, which is pure liquid honey fire, according to her. August 2006 was particularly drawing into the head with amazing head pressure that translated into more breakdowns during the back-to-soil phase of October-November. She says, don't worry, though, the more you facilitate the die-off period, the more profound will be the rejuvenating effects of next spring. So we're in the die-off period coming in now, collectively, if you're watching this when I'm recording it. So she's saying like it's a good time to facilitate the die-off to, and that can show up as depression sometimes too, but to like see what is the benefit of this feeling? How can I kind of lean into it and provide space for it? Doing art, making music, creative things can really assist with that, like to put those darker, heavier emotions into some form. She says the deeper die off means bigger spring regeneration. So expect a spiritual renaissance in April, May. She said in her April, May of 2007, I had a very intense period of extended space mind, high blood pressure, ecstasy, and revelation connected with the keystone and quantum mind writing at this time. It's interesting that toward November, December, after Kundalini has passed through its annual cycle of heart, spleen, pelvis, digestive system, there's some obvious Kundi activity in the right brain hemisphere and a noticeable spectrum influence of winter solstice. Wait, 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 I, I'm sorry, I skipped a line. And a noticeable Kundi heat in the right side of the body. So 
after this November, December. Thus, geomagnetic gravity and light spectrum influence of winter solstice might alter the configuration of the NMDA receptors to promote right brain firing. Thus, winter organisms are generally more right brain dominant than those in summer. So if you're born in the winter, um, that's me, I'm a winter solstice baby. So perhaps because they require more intuition and long range planning to survive in the winter, while summer is a time for building. And I highlight in this book, yeah, that's me. I need more intuition and long range planning. The initial cycles are apt to be of acute intensity in the peaks and valleys with a more lateral focus on the left side of the body as the solar heat establishes itself. But after several years, the cycles occur without abatement, but they are of lesser chronic intensity, smaller peaks and valleys, and more balance between the hemispheres of the brain. So as we go on, I mean, Kundalini doesn't just happen one time. It's an ongoing process. So the first one is going to be intense peaks, and then it's you know, it's oscillating, but smaller peaks as you go along. She says that is the male female poles within within find deeper reconciliation in the love making of soul with matter. This is that inner alchemy or inner divine marriage as the gross structures and blockages are cleared away and the body mind incarnates more of its superconducting soul template. So we don't have too much more. I'm going to go ahead and go for it. While we are lit and at our pen, penultimate self in the up cycle, we are essentially pumped up as high as our organism can tolerate at the time. All the chemicals that produce this state, however, create metabolites. So there is a down cycle. That's what we have to remember, okay? Um, that corresponds to rest and recovery and repair. So as high as you go up, you will go down. And that's something a lot of people don't like to do, but it happens. So the ensuing depression and disenchantment does have a subjective element, both individual and collective, but it's also very much caused by the cascade of neurochemistry, which has occurred, okay? There's an emotional component to this flip of having been in this high state of gratitude and wonderment and then returning back to normality, which can then feel like depression. She says, I've noticed on several occasions that Kundalini just increases, amplifies, and deepens, and often makes lucid whatever state or condition we're predisposed to at the time, and this exaggeration may increase the propensity for an obvious bipolar flip, right? Um, you're gonna, whatever you're normally feeling, you're gonna feel more intensely. So even if you're just like normally like happy and then a, like a bummer thing happens, it's going to seem like really exaggerated in the height of this chemistry. Okay. There is an emotional component. Yeah. So all chemistry is bipolar. We just are not usually conscious of the cycle because we're embedded in the present point of the hyperbolic curve. When we are on the roller coaster, or where we are on the roller coaster, depends on our age, the time of year, the time of month, and lots of other factors, okay? But most of all, it depends on the prior chemistry and the state that one goes into the peak event with, okay? That is, it depends on what is up in the lived experience of the psych psyche, body, soul, because most of us in subterranean, there's always something that's trying to emerge given enough energy, oxygen, and attention to do so. There's endless transconscious and pre-conscious material trying to filter into the conscious arena. A lot of stuff trying to come through if we let our guards down. So the perturbation of consciousness and infiltration of unconscious material can only work with the biochemistry and consciousness that we bring to it. Thus a Kundalini event or drug trip is a kind of judgment day, an exploration of the vaster consequence of our being than we normally have access to. So keep a spiritual diary to document your phenomena, your Kundalini phenomena, along with dreams so that you can map out your spiritual journey. If many people did this, we would have a lot of data to work with um, to work out the alchemy as it occurs in a range of types, but also by doing this and trying one's 
subjective experience into the monthly and annual cosmic cycles, it makes whatever stage we are in easier to handle when seen with the light of the larger picture. And this is why I do recommend you like watching astrology um, interpretations and tying them to your own experiences and seeing how, I mean, that's really good to get an objective perspective, like, oh, this isn't really just me, this is a cosmic happening. But it is happening to me, it's happening, I'm feeling it in my body, almost like the planets are making me do it. You know, it's good to see it's not just personal. Electromagnetic influences on the Earth's magno or magnetic sphere from the 22 year sunspot cycle has a direct ubiquitous effect on life and the weather. Okay, electromagnetic influences. The next 2011 solar max cycle, this is, she's writing this pre-2011, maybe the most intense solar maximum in 50 years, and of course we have even more greater ones since then. NCAR predicts it to be 30 to 50% stronger than the previous, and the intensity of solar activity almost equivalent to that of the solar max of 1958. So I have to look into what the solar max has been lately, but I know it's been ramping up. Bigger sunspot cycles ramp up faster than smaller ones. And lately, the max has tended to occur in two peaks. So David Wilcock talks about this in some of his material about sunspots and when they happen um, and mass solar ejections, how they occur with massive leaps in consciousness. So they do correlate with these Kundalini cycles. Um, besides electrical interference and amplified storm activity, she's predicting this 2012 thing, um, there will also be a large number of people going through kundalini awakenings during the next solar max, and of course now too. During such an exaggerated cycle, it would be easier to cor correlate solar activity with the effects of weather, kundalini, and mood. So for example, due to great, greater storm and hurricane cells, we can expect frequent reoccurring ecstasy and revelation periods. And then she says, you can watch the progress of solar activity on NASA or NCAR websites, spaceweather.com. And then she ends this um, section with the annual cosmic cycle. She says, Kundalini and the full spectrum of human existence and experience follows the same annual cyclic pattern as plant growth through the seasons. So a general monthly outline is follow. The seed time, is January, February, March. So that's head, heart, and then in like ethereal and abstract, that's the seed period. And then March, April, May are like the leaves. Your heart, solar plexus, powering up, and then like urgency sort of thing. And then the flowering time is June, July, August. Belly, pelvis, high heart, and heart, and, and like body physical illumination. And then the fruit happen in, happening in um, August, September, October, head pressure, uh, heart and lungs, and then revelatory chemistry. And then back to the soil in November, December, energy goes into the pelvis, die off, descent to subconscious mind, opening up to the right hemisphere consciousness. And yeah, so that's pretty cool that cosmic cycle that repeats in us and that's how we can awaken again and again to higher and higher levels of self so this is a broad overview of the cosmic growth cycle which cannot reflect the infinite variables and complexity of human existence and she says southern hemisphere people are obviously switching um, with their flower be period beginning in january february but the 22 year sunspot cycle probably follows a similar growth cycle from seed, leaf, flower, fruit, and soil. This is the flow of the Tao of life. It is a hyperbolic curve that spirals through time. The astronomical influences on cell development are instigated by the solar lunar influences on the electromagnetic field of the Earth. The sunspot cycle and the moon have a greater influence on health, fertility, consciousness, and behavior than any other cosmic influence. The goal being to unify the gestalt of objective and subjective, the yin and the yang, the introversion and the extroversion, the cosmos and the self. And then she ends this section with this quote from Phases of the Moon, A Guide to Evolving Human Nature by Marilyn Busted and Dorothy Worgen. Sorry, I'm sticking to my chair here. 
The moon phase concept is based on a fourfold division, instinct, emotion, intellect, and perception, as in Carl Jung's four functions of sensing, feeling, thinking, and intuiting. Or Max Lescher's four color persona, red, green, yellow, and blue. An interesting parallel appears when comparing the moon phases with Jungian psychology. Jung first defines two attitudinal types, the extrovert and the introvert. The moon phase concept also first defines two-fold division, primary and antithetical, primary objective and antithetical sub uh, subjective. So you can read more about that if you want to read phases of the moon. And tomorrow we're going to go in age and kundalini and just it will be a short one tomorrow. So I hope that you'll join me. Reading Biology of Kundalini by Jana Dixon. Tomorrow on, we're on eight, page 82. Thank you for joining me. It's Deja Bliss. If I can help you at all in your journey or support you in any way, please let me know. Send me an email. Write a comment down below. And if these videos are helping you, then share them with other people. Please get this information out. Like, subscribe, share, all that. Okay, we'll see you next time. Make sure to check out some of the other videos if you're going through stuff. And let me know what you would like to hear a video about, okay?